OK, welcome to part two of our exploration of the British and Irish fragrant orchids. We'll now focus on the question of whether we can use morphology to identify orchid species that are more readily identified using DNA-based techniques. I'll be basing my comments on the results of an extensive morphometric survey of British and Irish gymnodenia populations that Ian Denham and I began in 1985, but didn't formally publish until 2021. As we've already discussed, such large bodies of morphometric data are best summarised as multivariate ordinations. What I'm showing on the first of these ordinations here is the story as we understood it in 2016. At this point, we had measured 39 morphometric characters from 10 plants in each of eight populations in each of the three species. So basically we have 240 plants that have been measured and are plotted on this diagram. And we're looking for degrees of separation between the three species that have been identified using DNA-based techniques. And you can see that there's reasonable separation of most of the plants of the three species. So we have Borealis over in the left-hand side of this diagram, Densiflora towards the top of the diagram, and Canopsia towards the bottom right of the diagram, with some overlap, but it's an acceptable level of overlap to find between three species that are closely similar to each other and only subtly distinct. If we look at the two axes and look to see which characters are contributing most to them, which characters are helping most to separate the species, and we look at the first axis, the horizontal axis first, we can see that Borealis is being separated from the other two species because it has a narrower lip, it has narrower leaves, has shorter lip, shorter plants, narrower stems and so forth. In other words, basically a smaller plant in all its parts. If we look at the second axis here to see what's separating Densiflora from Canopsia sensi stricto, you can see that floral bract length is the single strongest contributor. There's also some flower colour characteristics that are suggesting a somewhat bluer flower in Densiflora compared with Borealis. And also contributing to this axis are bract cell length measurements. I'll discuss those later on and bracteoid leaf number, that too I will discuss later. Unfortunately, in 2016, we made the mistake of going out and measuring the populations attributed to subspecies Friesica. That is two populations from the Sussex Downs and the June Slack population from Kenfig in South Wales. And to oversimplify slightly, including those three populations did serious damage to our ability to discriminate the three species because there's now considerably greater overlap between Borealis and Canopsia sensi stricto and between Densiflora and Canopsia sensi stricto. And we find that the first axis, the horizontal axis, is still doing a reasonable job of separating Borealis from the remainder on, different, on both vegetative and uh, floral dimensions. But the second axis is a rather trivial one that is dictated largely by vegetative anthocyanins, vegetative pigments, which aren't species specific. And you actually have to go down to lower order axes before you get se good separation of canopsia from densiflora. So Friesica is uh, a serious problem. It really has caused difficulties distinguishing between the three species. Fortunately, on present evidence, Friesica is pretty rare, at least in the British Isles. And it seemed to Ian and myself that the best way to pursue these ideas was to start playing off pairs of taxa against each other to find out which characters most effectively separated just two taxa. So here for, we have one example, which is um, taking a set of downland populations to see whether we can distinguish Canopsia sensi stricto, shown in blue, from 
populations of Densiflora frisica shown in green. And you can see that there is good separation of the two taxa with very limited overlap. And you can find out which characters on this third axis here, the vertical axis, lip colour is still playing a major role. The shape of the outline of the lip is helping here with Densiflora tending to be broader a bit below the middle of its length, in other words, bulging out a little towards the tip of the lip. Spur length is also contributing and bracteoidal leaf number again is a significant separator of these two taxa. But the first axis, the horizontal axis, is simply distinguishing between weak plants and strong plants of both species. This is what you tend to find when the taxonomic differentiation between two taxa is relatively low. The vigour of the plants begins to dominate and you have a continuum from the weakest plant to the strongest, which is what this horizontal axis represents in terms of plant height, leaf length, leaf width, spike length, and so forth. It's what I call a vigor coordinate. But nonetheless, these lesser characters in the third axis, the vertical axis, are sufficient to separate the two taxa. At this stage, it's really quite instructive to look at characters that have been suggested in previous studies as separating Canopsia from Densiflora and Borealis. And in this context, the critical publication was the plant crib, and the gymnodenia portion of the plant crib was produced by Francis Rose as long ago as 1988, reproduced again in 98, and the same characters then used as found by Clive Stace in his Flora of Britain and Ireland. So these characters have been extremely influential over the years in helping us to separate what were then regarded as subspecies and are now regarded as species. But it's interesting to play off the ranges of variation that were attributed to the three species in these previous studies against our data. And in some cases, you find there is reasonable correlation between the rose data and our data. So if we look at labellum width, for example, Canopsia is suggested to typically have a range of five and a half to six and a half millimetres. We found it to average 6.1 millimetres, bang in the middle of that range, no problem. The same again occurs with labellum width in Densiflora. The, the previous authors gave a length of six and a half to seven, we got a mean of 6.8. And even Borealis is reasonably close. They suggested 3.5 to four, we have figure an average of 3.9. But if you then go down to the labellum length, you find a rather different picture. The value for canopsia, our mean for canopsia, is just within the range given by Rose. Our mean for Borealis is just within the range given by Rose at four millimetres. But for Densiflora, Rose gave a range of three and a half to four millimetres for labellum length we have a mean of 5.1, substantially larger. So whereas for rose, Canopsia has a longer lip than Densiflora, for us, it's the just the other way around, barely. And there are even bigger differences in spur length, whereas for rose, Densiflora had a significantly longer spur than Canopsia, we find the opposite with an average of 14 millimetres for Densiflora, but 15.3 for Canopsia sensi stricto. And even in characters like the position of the lateral sepals, uh, Rose argued that subspecies Densiflora, that uh, Gymnodenia Densiflora can be distinguished from the other two species by its horizontal lateral sepals. But we found the lateral sepals of Borealis to be equally horizontal. My nose isn't good enough to discriminate the fragrances of these different taxa. Supposedly, Canopsia differs from the other two, but certainly mass spectrometry has been done on the scents that are exuded by these three species, and their significant differences have been found. So the chemistry of the scents do differ. It's just that for us, there is no way we can differentiate them in the field with any confidence. Plant height, reasonably accurate, thanks to the broad range given by Rose. And we found somewhat narrower flowering 
preferred flowering periods relative to those given by rose. But if you then look for genuinely diagnostic characters in the, uh, the list given by rose, there are relatively few and they mostly relate to subspecies Borealis. There isn't a single character on the rose list that reliably differentiates Canopsia sensu stricto from the other two. Let's look at some individual characters. Here we're looking at labellum width, and you can immediately see from these histograms that Borealis has the shortest, the uh, narrowest rather lip. So we're looking at a mean of about four millimeters compared with Densiflora with the widest lip and a mean of about just short of seven millimeters. So a much larger flower, typical of Densiflora. And Canopsia occupies an intermediate position, but you can also see that the ranges of spur length within these species are quite broad. There's significant overlap between them. And I'm afraid this is the case for any character you might care to look at. There is no single character that will give you 100% distinction between the three species. If we go on to look at spur length, which uh, is emphasized in a lot of accounts of gymnodenia, the differences in spur length are actually quite subtle, the differences in mean spur length. And um, Canopsia, as I said a few minutes ago, has on average the longest spur, but again, a wide range of variation. Borealis, as you might expect, has the shorter spur, but it's matched in spur length by Frisica and Densiflora, this time Densiflora is the intermediate species between the two. So you do have to measure your spurs carefully and from more than one plant if you're going to get a sensible result. Flower colour again is useful, but it, again the differences are quite subtle. Here I've shown three strips from the Royal Horticultural Society colour chart, and you've got the slightly bluer purples to the left and the slightly redder purples to the right. And uh, as you can see, the pigment density increases from the bottom to the top of this diagram. And I've plotted on the four taxa here. So, uh, for example, Densiflora frisica is shown in yellow. And almost all of the frisicas that we measured were dark and they were relatively blue. So they're in the top left hand quadrant of this diagram. The remaining Densifloras, Densiflora Densiflora from the marshes are shown in green, and you can see that they have an intermediate pigment density and an intermediate shade between the redder to the right and the bluer to the left. And then Canopsia sensu stricto and Borealis tend to have the somewhat redder shades over to the right hand side of this diagram. But you I have to admit that these distinctions are subtle and Trying to recover this kind of distinction, for example, from photographs is really very difficult. Ideally, you need to look at the colour in the field in natural light. Next, we'll look at a character that was wholly ignored by both Francis Rose and Clive Stace. That is the number of bract-like leaves that occur on the stem immediately below the inflorescence. I define a bracteoidal leaf as one that is more bract-like than leaf-like and doesn't encircle the stem completely, unlike the leaves lower down on the stem. And if we look at this character, we find that on average, Borealis has two such leaves, Canopsia three, Densiflora frisica has four, and Densiflora densiflora has five. And that's what we see in the histograms over on the right-hand side. Of this diagram again with a certain amount of variation obviously again needing to look at several individuals per population before you get a sensible result. One other point I want to make is that when you look at accounts in floras and in implant crib there's a tendency to give metric measurements in these kind of manner in, in parentheses 8 to 11 to 14 to 15 millimeters for spur length, you would expect to find the majority of plants between 11 and 14. Canopsia, you do expect to find the 
majority of plants between 12 and 14 millimetres, density flora 14 and 16, if you believe the standard floras. But what if you give the data in this kind of fashion and you find a plant with a spur that's 14 millimetres long, it overlaps with the recommended range for all three of these species. That's not terribly helpful. What the way I prefer to do it is to say for each of these species, how what percentage of individuals are likely to be below or above 14 millimetres. And also, of course, it's really important that the data underlying these three ranges given here in rows and states are accurate. And if you plant the mean values that we have from our data, the free figures given previously for Borealis are bang on. The figure given for density flora is a little high, but it's within a reasonable boundary. And the figure given for Canopsia sensu stricta is way off. And you have to ask the question, whenever you're using a literary source like this, did the author actually measure any plants? If so, how many plants were measured to get a sensible result? Because you're hoping there's been a statistical sample. And were the plants actually alive in the field, like the plants that you're trying to identify at this particular moment? Or were they desiccated specimens that have been squashed in a herbarium sheet? All of these things make a big difference to how accurate the data are. So these are the money, the next three slides are the money slides. And here I've chosen to give the distinguishing characters as thresholds. And the way I recommend that you approach any unknown Gymnodenia population in Britain and Ireland is to begin by asking the question, am I looking at Gymnodenia borealis? We've got the best diagnostic characters separating Borealis, it's the easiest one to pull out from the remainder. We've got several characters, all of which are relatively easy to measure. And what I've given on this table is a threshold measurement and then the percentage of plants of Borealis that fall below that threshold relative to the percentage of plants of the other two species. So if we look at lip maximum length, I've given a threshold of 4.4 millimetres. 86% of Borealis plants will fall below 4.4 millimetres. But only 26% of Canopsia and Densiflora will be below 4.4 millimetres. So that's quite a useful character. Lip width is even more useful. If you've got a threshold of 4.9 millimetres, 97% of your Borealis will fall below that measure and only 6% of the other two species. So that's how I've chosen to present these diagnostic characters. Uh, you've also got a good uh, probability of separating Borealis from the remainder by looking at the depth of sinuses. Those are the little indentations that separate the three lobes of the lip. You can also look at the inflorescence length and get a good result flower number, which obviously correlates with inflorescence length to some extent, and stem diameter. All of those characters will help you pull out Borealis from the remainder. If we've decided that our population isn't Borealis, then we're going to want to try and separate Densiflora from Canopsia sensu stricto. And here are the characters that are most effective for doing that. And our first two characters here are colour characters, and you've already seen how subtle those distinctions are. But basically, to pull out Densiflora from Canopsia, you're looking for a slightly bluer purple and a slightly darker purple. And if you can find that, you're going to find that around about 80 to 85% of the plants will have those characteristics if it's Densiflora but only 20 to 30% of the plants in the other two species. You're going to have difficulty measuring the Brack marginal cell length unless you have a decent microscope, but that's another character that can be brought into play, the length of the cells along the margin of the Bract. Plant height is once again useful. Densiflora tends to have a stem taller than 30 centimeters. As we've already discussed, Densiflora tends to have four or more bracteoidal leaves below the inflorescence, and it tends to have longer, wider leaves, 
greater than 125 millimeters long and greater than 12 millimeters wide. Those characters, you'll see that their effectiveness isn't quite as good as most of the characters that distinguish Borealis from the other two. But if you've used these characters to successfully separate Densiflora, um, or you haven't been able to use these characters to separate Densiflora, then you're definitely looking at Canopsia sensi stricto. That's effectively your null hypothesis. And then we've got other properties, not morphology of the plants, but other properties we can look at as well. And these are at least as useful in separating populations as the morphology is. So if we're looking at flowering periods, for example, Canopsia sensi stricto at any particular latitude and altitude, Canopsia sensi stricto tends to flower just a little ahead of Borealis, although there's very little in it. They're both relatively early flowering. Densiflora is significantly later and there's little, if any, overlap between Densiflora and the other two species. If you've made it the second week of July and the plants are only just coming into flower, there's a high probability that you're dealing with either Densiflora Densiflora or Densiflora frisica. Habitat also helps. Borealis is very much an acid-loving or at best neutral uh, soil-loving plant mostly found on heathland with a degree of moisture, not the driest of heathlands. Canopsia, very much the plant of life, limestone grassland, occasionally dunes, not very often. Densiflora, calcareous marshes, marshy meadows and dune slacks. And just with this problem, this background problem of freesica, which can occur in limestone grassland or dune slacks. Another way of looking at this problem is instead of looking at individual plants where there's a significant risk of an erroneous identification, look at the mean values for populations instead. And that's what's been done in this diagram. And if you look at the average value across the entire population, it completely separates the three species, Borealis over on the left, Densiflora on the top right, and Canopsia on the bottom right. And if you actually impose a, a linkage clustering system on this, you can see how the different populations of, that belong to the same species mostly group tightly together. So really, it's quite useful to start thinking in terms of identifying populations more than individuals. But if we look at the horizontal axis, we'll find out that the characters separating Borealis over there on the left from the other two species are the same characters. Lip length to the central lobe, lateral lobe, leaf width, number of flowers, lip width. They're the same characters in a slightly different order. And similarly, the characters separating Densiflora from Canopsia sensi stricto, bract length, lip color, um, and although not shown on this diagram, number of bracteoidal leaves. So that's how we go about identifying these plants, focus very much on populations. There are two postscripts, two things that we need to keep at the back of our minds when we're identifying Gymnodenia populations. Firstly, it is the point I've already strongly emphasized, don't identify individuals, identify populations. So on the left-hand side here of this uh, PowerPoint slide, I've shown a page from David Lang's book on Sussex orchids, where on the left he, collect, he correctly predicted that the couple of downland populations in Sussex that are late flowering were going to turn out to be Densiflora, and he was right. But he also suggested that the population shown on the right-hand side of that page from his book, uh, near the center of this PowerPoint slide, was Borealis and subsequent DNA analysis showed that it was actually a depauperate set of plants of Canopsia sensi stricto. So it's dangerous to look at individual plants. And the same applies to the page on the right hand side of this diagram, which is taken from the orchid flora of the county of Bedfordshire, where 
a single particularly vigorous plant of subspecies Canopsia here is being accused, uh, from chalk downland, is being accused of being Gymnodenia densiflora. Uh, yet if you look at the plants of Dactylorhiza fuchsia in this same picture, you can see they're just coming into flower. This picture is ta clearly taken in June, and there's just no way that that plant is actually Gymnodenia densiflora. It's just an unusually vigorous Canopsia. So identify populations, don't identify individuals. But then something else that will likely be plaguing the backs of your minds by now is hybridization. How often do you find populations that mix at least two of these three species? And the answer, fortunately, is fairly rarely. But nonetheless, it does happen. So, for example, here I've illustrated in the top right, Lot Moraig in Scotland, where Gymnodenia borealis flowers relatively early on these grassy slopes, immediately above a alkaline marsh, a series of flushes, where Gymnodenia flowers, uh, Densiflora flowers two weeks or more later. Then in the bottom left of this diagram, I've shown Mullock Moor near County Clare, round the back of Mullock Moor, there is limestone pavement as with, as you would expect, Canopsia sensi stricto, but within the limestone pavement are little pockets of acidic peat in which grow Gymnodenia borealis. And then on the bottom right here, I've shown Ditchling Beacon in Sussex, where we've got Canopsia and Densiflora frisica occurring together on the same strip of downland. Uh, Densiflora tends to occur on a strip of downland with slightly deeper, moister so soils than Canopsia, but the main difference is again a two week difference in flowering period. Fortunately, Friesica appears on current evidence to be relatively rare. So, where are we? When you're looking at your Gymnodenia populations, consider their appearance, their flowering period, and their habitat. Look at the whole population. Don't be fooled by atypical individuals. Carry a ruler with you and include it in your photographs if you're going to try to do identifications after you've got back home. Watch out for the boogeyman of subspecies Friesica, which I hope isn't too common. And if we can all work together on this, eventually we will improve those maps of Gymnodenia to the point where we have a much stronger understanding of these plants. And with that, I'll leave you with a bibliography of recent publications that might help to entrench some of the comments I've made during the two parts of this talk. And I've also included my email address. And with that, I thank you for your interest.